Hi, Emily, and welcome to the show. It's good to have you here. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, Emily, you've been doing some pretty interesting work. And when I was going through your new book and so on, one thing that jumped out for me is that typically new executives are apprehensive about their roles. I mean, that's normal. I remember when I first became a partner, although I was very happy and I really enjoyed the partner dinner, I was a bit scared in terms of whether I could live up to the task. And I had role models that I could, you know, go to and watch what they did. But in a COVID era, when there are no role models, I mean, this is the first time executives are going through that. Do you see more apprehension and how are they handling it when there's no one they can look to? Yeah, it is different. So we have done several um, executive onboardings through COVID. And I will say, even in the best of times, executives are anxious, they're worried, they're stressed out, right? They're excited, just like you said, they're excited, but worried. And what I've noticed most, I think, during COVID is that, you know, so much and of what we suggest, you know, and get clients for is build relationships, like spend a lot of time building relationships that first, you know, 90, 120 days, build relationships, get to know people, let them get to know you so that you and learn. That's how you learn about the company and the culture and the history and, you know, what people have been through and what they've tried and not tried, like. That, that is your learning period. Yes. And so much of that happens through informal channels, right? It's water cooler talk, or it's, you know, you're walking down the hall after a meeting, they're like, hey, can I talk to you about yeah. XYZ? And for executives that are new, particularly if they're new to the company, they don't get any of that. And you don't get that on Zoom, right? Everyone stays on mute yes. until we're running the leader, like, <laughs> or the meeting, like, set, starts talking, and then everyone unmutes or whatever. There's no informal chit chat. And so... I think without that, they're missing really critical learning opportunities to learn about the company and the people that they're going to be working with. And without those relationships, it can be quite difficult to move a business agenda because you need cooperation for that. Yes. And so I definitely see leaders going, how am I supposed to like yes. be connecting and learning? And um, they, they've definitely been handicapped. So it's just going to take like a lot longer. Now, now people are starting to come back to work, depending on the, the company. Yes. I mean, our companies are all over the range. But now that they're coming back, it's getting a little bit easier. But for certain people, especially people that were new right at the onset of yes. COVID, who never even got to come to their company yes, that's before, rough. it's been rough. Yeah. So I would imagine that right now, companies are doing the best they can to equip existing and new executives. But we don't really know what's the impact going to be until maybe three or four years when we've seen how these leaders develop. I remember when I was a partner, best way to learn everything is not through the knowledge system because nothing valuable is in that knowledge system. If you want to learn how to sell, you've got to watch another partner sell. If you want to learn how to talk to clients, you've got to go to a meeting with a partner. If you want to convince someone to do something very controversial, you never discuss it over the phone, over email. You find the person, take them to coffee. Now, those skills are not being developed. Are you seeing problems for new executives who are not able to get those skills from watching and working with someone? Mm. Well, I, I, don't think the, I don't think the pandemic has gone on long enough for us to see what the long-term consequences yes. of this are. And most of the people that we deal with are not very junior, right? Yes. They're not brand new executives usually. So they've, so they've learned things over time. They've, got, they've gotten that a lot probably from the past. And so they're, they, they can continue to operationalize that. I think what I worry about most for them, because they've had that opportunity probably, now they need more of it. But I think I worry more about the informal channels of communication, yes. the informal channels of promotion, visibility, opportunity. That's what for sure I can see already that they're not getting. But that having someone to be able to model, I think most of them, at least in our population that we serve, most of them yes. have gotten that in the past, and so they're okay. Yeah, that's a good point. So older executives who've been through the mill as such, they have those role models. It's the younger executives. But most young people don't really have executive positions because they're starting out. So they're, there's a totally different skill set that they are missing. So for yeah, someone I taking- more, in- I worry more about them. I'm sorry to cut you off. I, I worry oh, more about sure. them you know, because they're missing some of those critical, it's like having a student that, you know, they're graduating 12th grade, but they skipped two grades or they just missed it, right? They were absent yes. those two years. It's like, okay, but there's this really important thing that you're supposed to learn and you didn't learn it. So I do worry more. We don't tend to work with young, super young executives. That's just not where we're placed. Um, but I do worry about their development and, and they tend to be very prone for wanting to stay home, working from home and continue yes. to do that. 
And I think what they don't realize that they're missing is a lot of that grooming that you're talking about. And so I wonder in five years from now, if we're going to see kind of a knowledge gap in that population or no. Yeah, that's a good point because I remember when one of the things I advise any client is that we talk a lot about mentoring in the world today, but I find the biggest benefit is role modeling, whereby you actually observe a senior person as opposed to waiting for them to give you feedback. And obviously junior people are not getting that now. Do you think companies should be doing something to prepare for this gap in capability that's going to be hitting the executive ranks in five to eight years? Is there something companies should be doing? Is there anything they can do about it? Or is it just something you have to deal with when it happens? I think a lot of that's going to depend on how the pandemic is handled and how, you know, how much people come back to work. So, and that's depending on the company, right? So I've got some clients where everyone's back to work. They've been back to work the whole time. And that's the end of the story. Yes. And then I have some companies that are like, it's all remote now. And yeah. I think... I think at minimum, to your point, that people observe a lot from watching. And as long as they're watching quality, right? As, yes. as long as they're watching like the right way, which they're not always <laughs> assuming they're watching the right way. I think those opportunities are certainly being missed. And, you know, I'm not against remote work at all. I think I just did a, a video on my 120 seconds of leadership thing that I do on LinkedIn. Yeah. So there's pros and cons, right? But that's what people are missing are the opportunity to see someone more seasoned, more experienced, do things. And it, it absolutely helps if you're watching it the right way. So I think in the absence of that, at least finding ways that people can be together for certain specific events or meetings so that even if they're largely working from home, those critical moments people can still observe and absorb and learn. I think I don't know another way around it. <laughs> I really yeah, don't. It's not as if there's a magic <laughs> bullet. It's completely <laughs> trial and error. Nobody knows what will work and different things will work for different people. So let's switch gears a little bit here, right? So there's been a lot of executive churn during COVID. Lots of people have resigned. And I mean, across the world, it's been shocking. So you've got a lot of these new executives coming in. What are you seeing as some of the patterns or some of the common challenges they are facing? Is it different in COVID? I think, well, I mean, it's different because for several reasons, I think one, the, the amount of churn, and, and I, I felt like I've worked with some pretty high churn clients yes. in the past, but I've never seen anything like this. And I've never seen companies that historically have had like waiting lines of people that couldn't wait to come work for them, like people competing to get just their foot in the door for anything. And, and it's been like that for, you know, 20 years. And now all of a sudden that company can't find workers. Yes. And I, I'm not talking frontline workers. I'm talking frontline to executives. Like they can't find enough people. So I think, you know, they're calling it, I think, the great resignation yes. right, 2021. And, you know, the labor shortage, I think, you know, everyone is very stressed. They're very taxed. Um, teams are running very thin. So I think I don't. Well, I think what I already spoke about. Right. They come in and everything's on Zoom or if everything's yes. on Zoom, they're at a start disadvantage for learning. But I think also people are inheriting teams that are much more taxed. Right. Yes. So I think it almost like if, if I'm a leader and I come in and, you know, my team has been through, you know, something horrific, right. They had a terrible leader or they had a terrible year or something, you know, really awful has been happening. And I inherit that team and I'm her- inheriting a really stressed, probably demoralized team. Yes. That that's a thing that happens. Right. And there's a way to lead that. But I think during COVID because teams are so lean and there is that labor shortage and people are scrambling for certain types of talent and they can't get it. So I think, you know, I've always thought that our clients seem to be really stressed about work, (laughs) like definitely work very, very hard. But I think now they're inheriting a stress that's not, it's not just the labor shortage, but they are stretched very, very thin. But it's also, you know, their home life has been disrupted. I've got, you know, two executives, you know, husband and wife, they're both senior level, C-level executives, and they've got two school age kids. And they can't decide who stays home every time a kid gets exposed, right? Wow. They're like, the job doesn't stop. So I feel like the level of stress is, is amplified by not just the isolation, which is definitely bad for people. Yes. And the chronic health things that are coming along with that. My husband works in health insurance. He's like, every marker has gone like through the roof because of COVID, like all the markers are up, you know, name it. And the markers are going up and not in a good way. And so I think we've got physical tax, we've got emotional, mental tax, we've got strap teams that don't have enough talent, and you've got people that have been trying to do this among, you know, managing their families and isolation and everything else and not getting to go on vacation. So I just feel like as stressed as I felt like people were two years ago, it's, it's higher now. So I think when in the past you might inherit a team that's like 
energized and yes. excited yeah. and they're super happy you're there and they're like ready to go. I don't see a lot of those teams right now. I just don't. And it's sad. You paint a very disparaging picture of going back into the C-suite for me, Emily. I think I'm going to take a pass on going back into the workforce. But what you say is true. I mean, you mentioned the word stress, I think, 15 times in that discussion. And it's true because you, when a new executive or an executive switches into a role, you're not simply inheriting a team, you're almost rehabilitating a team. Mm. It's a very different mindset. You've got, to, you've got to fix them, take care of them, emotionally counsel them, support them. And you've got lots of other issues happening at home. So it's almost as if there's a, there's a whole new skill set that leaders need, which takes them out of those business roles that they're so common at focusing on. And they've got to find ways to heal their teams, mm. show empathy, think about where they are. And it's very difficult to do that when you can't really see the person. They're on Zoom all the time. Yeah. So it's a different mindset. And what are some of the best practices that you're seeing in terms of how executives are doing that? I think one, to the extent that health policies allow I think having time with their teams, you know, I'm seeing, I just actually got a bunch of pictures from an executive that took his team out to do like, I don't know, wine and painting or something. And I was like, wine and painting over like, zoom. No, no. Like oh. they, they were able to be in person. Oh, that's in good. A place where they had to be in person. And so, but I would have never pictured this guy doing this. Yeah. Right. And so I think, you know, to the extent that health policies allow time to be together and at, if it's work, if it's play, if it's just being together, I think people are so starved for that in general. I think, you know, to the extent that companies deem it safe or CDC deems it safe or whomever you know, we're following, I think getting people together is, I mean, we're pack animals. Yeah. Right. We're not, we're not cats. We don't go off by ourselves and live alone our whole lives. Like yes. we live in herds and we need to be in herds. And so I think, you know, without that connection, I think people are really struggling and they may not even know that that's why they're struggling, but I do believe that's a big part of what we're struggling with. With the exception of some people that just don't like other people and would rather yeah. be alone, but most people, most of the time need that connection. I would say in terms of having a team, I mean, I definitely I feel like when executives take new roles, they need to do a conscious, thoughtful assessment of the talent on the team, how the state of morale is on the team. Like that's always something that I say matters, but I think they should, well, I think they have to spend more time on that, be more thoughtful about that right now, figure out, you know, where people are mentally and emotionally, where their bandwidth is, where their energy is, you know, if they're demoralized, if they're, I just think, if I always thought it was important, I now think that spice is important. So to spend that time and probably the biggest trend, I, the biggest thing I think helps is just listen. Yes. Right. Just check in, listen, lots of open questions. Don't rush people through meetings and understand that kind of like, I mean, it's the same as when you go to the doctor, if you're totally healthy, you don't care if he or she rushes through the, the appointment, yes. right? It's like, good, I'm out of here. But when you're sick, you know, if you've got a bad diagnosis, you want that doctor to slow down, Yes. take time, listen, listen, listen. And don't rush because that's a different scenario. So I feel like this is sort of metaphorically a time when consider all of your teams sick. <laughs> consider your teams all are having a serious challenge and you need to slow it down and really deliberately, thoughtfully ask them how it's going. I mean, you know, people don't always want to talk about their feelings, yeah. but try to get a read on where they are because no teams are the way they were two years ago. None. That's a very interesting thing. The default mindset is assume people need help. And I think that makes sense. You said something earlier, right at the beginning, which I want to go back to because it's quite interesting. So I used to be in management consulting. I have a lot of friends in investment banking, private equity, venture capital, and so on. And one of the most striking things I've seen in investment banking in particular, and I don't know if it applies to management consulting and VCs, but especially in investment banking, they tell me that since they've been in the industry, they've had the default mindset was, we got to bring in people, we got to churn them out and keep the 10% that do the best work. But they said the mindset has changed completely because now they're struggling to keep people. There are employees who will resign and quit because they just don't feel they're being taken care of. And the company has had to change the entire mindset from churning out the bottom 90% to figuring out what can they do to retain the employees they have. And these executives were telling me that it's completely new for them. They've never had to do this before. They've never had to be in a position whereby they had to listen to an 
analysts talk about their feelings and give them time off on a Friday because the previous model was that if you couldn't do the work, you can leave and someone will take your place. So those kind of skills are new in some industries. But I think it can, but I think one of the good things about COVID is it's forcing executives to take a better appreciation, I think, and also invest in learning those soft skills, which many industries treat as something they should have ignored and a sign of weakness. Yep. And is that something happening across industries or is it just investment banking is experiencing this? I don't know because our companies are, are more industry, right? Yeah. Agri agricultural manufacturing factories, like, so those kinds of businesses are not typically my client, although I have worked with some of the big consulting yeah. firms in the past. I would say this, and if you read the book, you know I have strong opinions on yes. this leadership philosophy, right? I didn't like it 20 years ago. I still don't like it. I think it's wasteful. I think it's inhumane. I think, why would you fire? So you're saying fire 90% of people. I've seen the, the more common models fire 10% every year. You know, after 10 years, you're firing good people. Yes. So, and I've seen, I mean, I've had clients with, you know, one of the two of the big consulting firms actually mm -hmm. that, you know, they're working 80 hours a week. They're yes. sleeping on a cot at the company that they're consulting on. So to me. And that's that, pretty common, that's, actually. That's pretty common. I, I know. And it's horrific. I think it's terrible for people. So, you know, young people fresh out of MBA school go and they work until they burn out and then they go do something else or they hang in for a while. So then they partner and hope life gets better. I just personally don't agree with that business model. And so I think. While it has been sustained, I think COVID, because of the great resignation and people are just sort of fed up with, you know, work circumstances that, I don't know, I think everyone kind of figured out life short through yes. COVID. Maybe that's what's driving it, that they're starting to say no thanks to that. And so I think it's actually a good thing that people are sort of saying no to those kind of inhumane leader, people leadership practices. I think those leadership practices were, they were built in the 80s. They belong in the 80s. And I'm glad to see them go and I'm glad to see them get challenged. Yeah, I remember when I was a consultant, this was when I was a business analyst, I think. I remember falling asleep on the floor of the boardroom of a client because it was 3 a.m. and we had not finished the work and there's a board meeting the next day. And it was commonly accepted as a badge of honor. And people would talk about it at drinks that I fell asleep. I only got home at 2 a.m. It was seen as a, something to be proud of. It's obviously unhealthy. It's the wrong kind of mindset to have. And you're right, COVID, one of the good things about COVID is it forces people to appreciate what is important to them and to mm -hmm. say no to unhealthy behavior. But I think yeah. not enough people are doing it. And hopefully when COVID passes, we don't go back to those unhealthy behaviors. So switching back to executives in new roles, what advice? So we've got clients all over the world, India, China, Singapore, and so on. Mm -hmm. They're obviously different cultures and there's different things at work. But for new senior executives, what would you tell them to focus on? when they take in these new roles? Well, and, and here's what's interesting. I think, you know, a, a large part of what I write about is trying to assess the culture, right, of yes. the company, but it's also assessing the culture of where you live, right? Yes. And that's true even in the States, which is, you know, where the bulk of our business is based. Clients in New York are not anything yes. like clients in California, are not anything mm -hmm. like clients down South, are not anything like clients in the Midwest. So I think part of, part of the assessment phase, which is, to me, that's your first 100 days. Everyone's like, here's my 100-day plan. These are all the things yeah. I'm going to do. And I'm like, can you stick that on a shelf for like three yes. months? Just listen, listen, observe, observe. So I think it's both observing the culture of the company, right? Are they competitive? Like to your point about, you know, falling asleep on the floor is a badge of honor at three in the morning, you know? But I'm coaching the guy whose kid needs therapy because he's gone all the time and, and cries anytime he sees, yes. sees a suitcase. So I see the dark side of that, right? But I think if that's the culture of the company that you work for, like you've got to figure out if that's what it takes, like that's what it takes. I don't think that's healthy. I would not make that choice for my life, but you at least need to know what the expectations are. And I think that goes, you know, even broader with, you know, the, the country that you're working in. And certainly we deal with a lot of expats on yeah. both sides coming and going. And, you know, a piece of what has to happen is that you have to assess the culture of the company that you're in, but also like where you live and what those norms are. Because if people don't see you, you know, and I think in this day and age, people are pretty good with fluid with people coming and going in different cultures. And I think it's gotten a lot better, but you still need to have some sense for what will and won't be accepted or rewarded or, you know, a silly mistake that you don't realize is a mistake, but it is there. So yeah. I think all the more reason 
to just take time to assess. And again, that even goes, you know, China has a whole lot of areas, right? Yeah. It's not one China, there's lots of different parts of China. So it's assessing kind of in this place, this is more the norm, just like, you know, I'm a Midwesterner, you know, I'm very Midwestern, but if I go to California, I have to dial it back a little bit. If I go to, you know, down South, I have to, you know, slow it down a little bit. If I go out East, I've got to get a little more edgy because otherwise they kind of walk all over you. Yes. So you have to sort of flex and adapt to the culture of where you live and work. That's interesting because I remember once I was uh, doing a lot of work in Latin America, Chile and Brazil, mm -hmm. and another partner was asking me advice. Do you have any advice for working in Latin America? And I'm thinking that Latin America is so big. I mean, Chile is completely different from Brazil, from Argentina, from Colombia. So I can't give you any advice for the whole of Latin America. So you are right. You know, it's about, and I, and I like your answer because it's all about assessing what is happening. Yes. And I remember when I took over a company once, I spent the first 30 days taking detailed notes of everything I saw. Because after a year, I became part of the problem. I couldn't see things that I'd seen in those first 30 days. And I used to go back to my notes and say, wow, I saw this, it was a problem. But after one year, I became part of the problem. Mm -hmm. It was so hard for me to notice things. So this thing about assessing things, about understanding cultures, understanding people, and so on, and thinking about what changes need to happen. But how do you go about influencing people to make those changes? Because mm -hmm. this is one of the biggest roles of a new leader. You're coming in to bring about a change, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know... And good for you for spending 30 days at least. Like I encourage people to spend even more time than that, just like listening, asking yes. questions, taking notes, comparing notes, right? Do I hear the same thing from people above me as I do people below me? Do I hear the same thing from peers? If not, why? Because different groups are going to have different perspectives, right? And I think, you know, absorbing as much of that as possible is really critical. And the way you get influence is by, and this is why you have to pay attention to culture, right? And I, I'm not for people pretending. I'm very big on people just being super real, which is yes. why I would never go to work for a company where I had to, you know, cut 10% of my people every year. I wouldn't do it. That would be anti me. So I just wouldn't do it. So pick a company that has at least close enough to your values that you're okay with how things go. And then how you gain that influence is by fitting in enough, right? I want people to be true to themselves. Yes. But if I notice that the culture that I'm in is very collegial, cooperative, um, non-confrontational, then yes. I don't want to come in guns blazing, you know, yeehaw cowboy, because they're going to go, oh my gosh, that person does is so anti how we are that your style will take your ideas out the door with you. And, mm -hmm. and I don't mean they'll fire you over it. They usually don't. They'll tolerate you, <laughs> but they'll also in their minds say, wow, this person is so anti-culture. They're so counter yes. to how we do things here that I I can't accept this person. I therefore can't accept his or her ideas, even if they're high quality ideas, the ideas go out the door with you and they just isolate you from power. I call it, I don't even think I write about this in the book, but I, I call it organ rejection. Yes. Like you can transplant a perfectly good heart into my body, but if my body decides it does not want that heart in the body, the body will kill the heart. And that's exactly what ha happens in organizations if people can't assess the culture quickly enough to fit in enough. And I hate saying that. I feel like that totally steps on any DNI initiatives. Yes. But you have to fit in well enough that people are willing to listen yes. and be influenced. And while you're doing that, you're also building relationships. You're letting people know who you are as a person, not just who you are as a professional. Let them know who you are, get to know who they are, care about your people, be curious about them and their career and where they, whatever, like absorb all of that. And then people will sort of feel like, oh, okay, they want to belong to our group. They want to belong here. And then all of a sudden they like your ideas better. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah. It's and a very simple it's thing, right? Not that hard. It's a very simple thing. To influence a group, you have to do it from within. Yeah. Now, there's a very funny story. I was dealing once with a client and she moved from a very elite firm to a not so elite firm. But her model when she moved to a new employer was that she would every chance she got, she would tell her new employer how her other firm did it better. And she couldn't understand why nobody liked her. Right. I mean, it's obvious. You can't tell someone that they're inferior and they don't know what they're doing. So I see this quite often because a lot of people come in thinking they are better. They have a significance complex. And especially in hard charging careers and the kind of uh, clients you have, a lot of 
people have a significance complex. They're in these roles to have significance. They went to Harvard to be significant. They worked six hours so hard to be significant and be someone better. But then they don't know how to switch it off. They don't know it's a tool. There are times when you have to be significant. There are times when you need to be insignificant. Insignificant is a form of leadership, which people don't appreciate at times. There are times you have to make yourself insignificant so the other party feels comfortable to talk to you. And this ability to switch on and off is very important. So you were talking about, you know, listening and understanding in those first 30 days, first 100 days. I think a lot of people, especially when they come into troubled organizations, they think they were brought in to be change agents, but they don't understand you have to change from within and put the significance complex behind them because it can be quite damaging. I've seen so many talented executives come in with the right ideas, the right attitude, but they don't build a team around them. And they have a perfectly capable team, but they reject their team. Mm-hmm. And they wonder why the team doesn't like them. It's happened so often. You know, I'm sure you've seen this in your career, but I've seen talented CEOs go into companies and they're not able to convince the executive vice presidents to roll out a transformation. And if the board sees you're not getting the change done, the board replaces the CEO and the CEO goes on record saying that he couldn't make the company do anything, but he never tried in the first place. Mm-hmm. He just told them they were wrong. Yeah. So I'm sure you've got lots of stories like it, but How do you coach someone, an executive who has a significance complex? How do you get them to see that? I'm sure you've dealt with that many times. Oh, yeah. Well, for sure. And I've never heard it called the the significance complex, but I'm I'm absolutely stealing that phrase from you because that's that's exactly what it is, right? People come in and uh, there's actually a a great story in the book about it. A colleague that I had that came in, you know, from a different university when I was still, you know, teaching and, you know, and poo pooed everything yeah. that we did, like exaggerate, like re- like literally. I'm in a meeting. She's like, "Oh wow, like that? Why would you do it like that?" And we we're all like, you know, I'm looking at my chair, going, <laughs> "Is she kidding right now?" Like I thought she must have been kidding because it was so exaggerated, right? Yeah. I'm like, okay. And I see this all the time. And my counsel to executives is, "Look, I don't care if you think people's work is antiquated. I don't care if you think it's subpar." Like, give it a minute to decide on your talent. And there may be people that are subpar that have to go eventually. That's fine. That is what it is. But when they come in and they start critiquing the work and critiquing yes. the decisions and critiquing whatever, like you're basically saying, whoever you are, you've been here five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, six months, doesn't matter. I'm telling you what's being done here is bad, subpar, inferior, antiquated. So you're basically telling that person that the 40 or 50 or 60, depending on where you work, hours a week that you work, all of that time that you put that effort and attention yeah. into your role was bad. And then you expect them to like you and get on board with you and be super excited to follow you in a new direction. Who would be excited about that? Nobody. So my counsel is you don't call people's baby ugly. Right? Yes. Certainly people have ugly babies. You just don't say it. You wait till the kid grows up a little bit and then you find other things to be excited about, right? So same with people's work. That is their baby. That's what they've been doing every week for how long? And so reserve criticism. I also think people get really bristly when people say, what my last firm, what my last company, well, when I was in such and such a company and people, what it does two things. One, it's they were better than you are, which doesn't feel great even if it's true. And then people also subconsciously say, you're still associated with that company. Yes. You still in your mind belong to that company and you're over here and we're the outsiders and you're critiquing us. And we thought you were coming onto our team. And all it does is tell people that I think you're not as smart as me and you're not as good as the last company I came from. And by the way, I still associate with that company more than I associate with you. So there's like 10 reasons baked in there why people don't get on board and they don't like you and they won't get behind your business agenda and they'll drag their heels and they'll subvert you, yes. right? They probably can't fire you, but they'll do everything that they can to make it difficult for you. And, you know, so as far as the significance complex, the thing that I find really interesting about what I do, because our, our program, you know, we onboard executives. Yes. It's not everything we do, but it's a lot of what we do. It's always voluntary. And I always tell companies, if they don't want it, yes. don't pay for it because they're not going to engage correctly. But I tell you, especially after I've been with a company for five years or 20 years, like I can tell you there is a one-to-one perfect ratio between people that have the significance complex and therefore think they don't need any help. 
and they blow it up. Yes. <laughs> and then people I've that are like that. humble, they're like, oh, I'll take all the help I can get. I just want to do a great job. My gosh, yes, let's let's do this and, and please help me. They're humble enough to know that maybe they have one small thing to learn that'll help this go well. So the people that don't think they need the help because they have that you know, significance complex, mm -hmm. they actually do all the wrong things usually. And the people that probably didn't really need the help because they, they have good instincts, they're humble, they always take the help. So it's ironic. The people that need the help the most don't take it. Well, it makes sense. If you have a significance complex, by default, you have to create a situation where everyone is not significant around you. Yeah. And that's shows through in your in your words your mannerisms how you attend meetings whether you arrive on time whether you arrive late whether you take the time to read someone's work before a meeting whether you take the time to give useful feedback and you know as humans we can we are throwing off a thousand signals at any time mm -hmm. and it's very easy for us to see if someone is actually sincere if they care and, and, and you know with COVID today when people are resigning in mass as you pointed out who wants to work for someone who thinks they're better than us? Nobody really. Nobody wants that. Everyone is looking. One thing I've seen with people around the world, and you can go to any country in the world, everyone just wants to be seen and listened to. Yes. If you can just see someone for who they are, and maybe they did a terrible job, but you know what? They've got a kid. They missed the whole weekend. They put in the time. The work may not be great, but they tried. So maybe they just don't know how to do it. Find a way to coach them. Find a way to give them enthusiasm, energy. Mm -hmm. And when the moment is right, mm -hmm. then correct them. Yep. And especially, I've seen this, especially in executives in, in, a, in my world, management consulting and so on. Some of them are really good, but the others are so pressed for time mm -hmm. that they don't realize that everything can be done in five minutes. Mm -hmm. You can't inspire someone make them feel good, and then say, oh, I've got one minute left in this five-minute conversation. I'm going to tell you 10 things you did wrong. This focus on productive, short -term, what I call short-term productivity, being productive in the short term, mm -hmm. but causing long-term losses is very common, especially now with COVID and people under the gun, the supply chain problems and so on. I always coach people and say, you've got to first build the relationship to manage the relationship. You can't manage a relationship until you build it. You don't have a relationship with this person. You can't tell him something so important about his future, about his work and some deficiency he or she may have because it's very personal. When you go up to an investment bank and tell them something about the way they manage clients, but you don't have the relationship with them to actually give them that counsel. Mm. So it's about, as you say very well, you, know, you, sp you spoke about that. You've got to spend those first few days assessing things, but really it's about building relationships. You were really trying to find out who is this person? What makes them tick? How do I motivate them? What do they want? So this person is, everyone's very talented. I think everyone's very talented, but you got to find a way to switch them on or off. Mm -hmm. And if someone's very talented, will they work for me? How can I get them to do that level of work for me? Mm -hmm. Because most people just, they can do amazing work, but there are times when they don't want to do amazing work. And you have to know how to switch them on and off. Mm -hmm. But most executives, I feel some of them take it for granted that if you work in certain companies, it's the job of the HR department to hire talented people. And it's the job of the executive to just use the people as mm -hmm. opposed to figuring out ways to bring out the best from people. I think we're saying the same things just in different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Emily, thank you so much. I actually enjoyed this call very much. Thank you. It's very clear to me that you actually love what you do love it. and you are very good at it. And I can honestly tell you, I don't say that about many people. Uh, you really enjoy what you do. So I don't think you see this as work. Nope. I love it. Literally, I tell people, and I'm not saying I don't have my share of stresses. But yes, your bad days. Really, literally, I'm like, I have the, it's literally what I wanted to do from the time I was 22. When I realized I wasn't going to be a premier ballerina, I had to find <laughs> something else to do yes. or an actress, whatever. Like, this is exactly what I knew I was going to do. And I... I love it. I love it. And it's been 22 years and I still 22 years. Like, really love it. Yeah. So you spent half of your life doing this. Yes. I mean, that's, well, I'm a little older than that. <laughs> and you have such an energy for it. And I can see it in your work, the work I've read about and the way you speak about it. It's very good. I'm, I'm, I'm sure your clients enjoy working with you. I can see the kind of greatness you bring to your work. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for seeing me. Well, take care and we'll be in touch. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.